Imagine what it'd be like if we were really curious about each other. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Relational Spirituality, the weekly podcast of LargerStory.com, the podcast that sees all relationships as spiritual and all spiritual formation as relational. Now, here's your host for this week, Roseanne Moore. Hello, Larger Story audience. We are so happy to have you back with us today. I'm Roseanne Moore, your host today on the Relational Spirituality Podcast. And I have Carlene Cannon, a Mm co-host, but she's getting interviewed today (laughs) because when we first introduced this podcast, we had such a fun conversation that we both walked away going, we need to do this more. <laughs> so uh, it's my turn to ask Carlene some more questions today. Carlene, <laughs> thanks for being here. Thank you, Roseanne. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. I love talking to you. Yeah, I love talking with you too. So part of the the whole real church conversation mm. that we're having comes from mm. our deep dive into Larry's book, mm. Real Church. What is it? Does it exist? Where I can find, where can I find it? Those are some of the questions he asks. What would make me want to go to church? Those are some of the questions he wrestles with in the book. And I think they're highly relevant. Maybe they always have been, but they're Mm -hmm. certainly highly relevant in our culture today. Let's start with what has been your experience with church? If you gave like an overview timeline, what has that looked like for you? Yeah, I was thinking about that yesterday before this conversation and was surprised by my own internal reaction to the question as I started to really consider my journey with church. So I'm going to hopefully not get too emotional, but I was actually driving in the car as I was thinking through this and had a few teary moments. I think when I think about my first experience with church, I grew up in a Christian home. I was very fortunate and We went to a little country church. I grew up in Dallas, Texas, and we lived probably 20 minutes from this downtown area, but another 20 minutes out was just still country. Now it's all big suburb, but so we went to this small little church and it was like a family reunion every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, but that was my sense of family. I was an only child and was adopted. My parents had waited or had waited for a child for a long time. So that was where I had a sense of siblings and aunts and uncles. And just, in fact, in that time period, I called all of the adults of the church, aunt this and uncle that. That was just how we talked to each other. And so that was a very safe, secure, holy family experience. And then when I was 10 years old, my parents got divorced and and it was like the church divorced us in 1980. You just didn't do that in church settings. And there was nothing in that little church that was there for us. And because I guess it was smaller, I, maybe there was some sense of divided loyalty. I don't know. I was young. I'm not really sure, but we left that church. And left my family behind. So that was my first experience of what is now thought of as church hurt. Like the whole side of dealing with human humans that is hurtful. It happens in church too. We moved from there to a larger church that had a singles group and a more robust children's and youth program. And that became a home church. And was a really good place for me to land. And me and my mom, we met other families that were made up more like ours, single mothers and divorced parents. And that's where I spent my junior high and high school years and really where I grew up in my faith. I was really fortunate to have adults that cared about young people and noticed me and invested in me and just became my own steward of my faith in that church. And that was really important. I learned a lot of spiritual disciplines and because of my personality and the way I had chosen to do life, that fit very well for me. I was, I I took to it the whole 
check the boxes and do all the right thing. You have your quiet time every day. So you have a good day really worked for me. <laughs> and I, I did get to know Jesus through that. I was doing it in a lot of ways for the wrong reasons. I very much bought into that. If I do these right things and pray this way and take these sermon notes and then I will succeed in life. Bless your life. <laughs> but it, it worked. Then I went to college and went to a very secular university and my faith was challenged everywhere in every class and every interaction. And I turned to my church for support in trying to navigate that and actually had a I had a conversation with my pastor at home and asking him questions of things that I was running into at in college. And I don't remember much of the conversation except him just saying, you're just, a, this is a unique situation. Most kids don't run into this stuff in college. I don't really know what to tell you. And I, know, and I was like, wow, I was shocked by that. Um, and so that was my second experience of, I really need something here. And not only are do you not have anything to offer me, but you don't really care. Right. It was kind of a cavalier. I'm sorry. I just can't help you. Or at least that's how I remember it. And so I could be remembering it unfairly, but that's how it, they ended with me. And fortunately, God is the one who is orchestrating my path. And I went back to school and found some people there and a church there that had more answers to my questions and that had more affinity with the journey that I was on. And it was a very formative time in my life. And in some ways, I'm really grateful to that pastor because he left me in a desert where I had to decide, do I know God? Do I really, have I really experienced something that is more real and more true than anything I'm hearing in all of these classes and all of these conversations and what is really meaningful? What is really solid? And I was pushed to a place where I had to decide and I don't remember the exact moment, but I remember very clearly this point of decision where I was brought to tears because I knew, not rationally, but with everything in me, I knew that I knew God, that God was real and that he had sought me out and that I was his. And even though I had made a profession of faith as a kid and you know, would have said I was quote unquote saved and baptized as a child, there was that moment where in the midst of not having what I thought I needed from church, I was very certain that I had what I needed from God. And I am actually really grateful again. for that. Say that again. In yeah. that moment that I knew, say, I'm not yeah. going to say it the way you did. Uh, say it again. Yeah. In, the, <laughs> in that moment, yeah, you it, weren't it, getting what you needed from church. You knew that you were getting what you needed from God. Exactly. So, wow. Yeah. I, and the stripping away of not getting what I asked for from church, not getting my questions answered, not getting the encouragement or the, or even just being taken serious. Like there was some of the, some of what I experienced that just felt like you don't even care. Like God was there. God is taking me seriously. God is answering my questions and he answered them in ways that perhaps I would have wanted a different answer. Like I might've wanted a rational point by point logical argument, but he came in and gave me something I never had before. And that was this certainty, this relational experience of witness okay. that, that went beyond the rational argument. Uh -huh. And 
for that, I am so grateful. I could look back at the pastor and wish that he had been more supportive. But in some ways, and I think this is a lesson for all of us when we talk to people, in some ways it was his, what I would maybe call his failure to meet me where I was at that kept my heart hungry for God and kept me open to this other opportunity where God wanted to meet me in a way he hadn't before or that I hadn't been available for. And so I think I learned even in that, even my earlier experience, I learned whether it was conscious or not, that in the human failings that I had experienced at church, that God stepped in and filled in the gaps. And if I was open and expectant that I found him in new ways. And I don't know that I would have thought of that consciously, but I think that was what I had, I was collecting these experiences where I'd been, I was being disappointed, but God was showing up in unexpected ways. I, I think that's such an important distinction because in church, you are dealing with people who may be, okay, so yeah. there's nobody who's not in the process of being sanctified. Like the best people are still, what I'm trying to say is the best people are still in the process of being sanctified, which means right. they fail. We yeah. all fail. I think what you're describing is the difference between church hurt and church trauma. Like mm -hmm. trauma is what you're describing is things where people didn't have ill intent toward you, right. but they just didn't meet you, meet yeah. your needs or where they were in their own journey was they just, there was growth that they needed. And so they couldn't meet you. Yeah. In truth, yeah. the way you needed. And that's an important distinction. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. Yeah. I think that's really different from a person who is deliberately using spiritual power to do harm for their Absolutely. own gratification. Yeah. And for those who have experienced that category, yeah. the, I think the process looks different of finding God in the middle of that, that can look very different, sure. but because our culture tends to put things in big baskets, the yeah. distinction you're making for people who have been just failed in some right. ways, not right. harmed. Yeah. There's pain, there's harm, there's sure. hurt, hurt. That's a good word. There's hurt. Mm -hmm. There is, there are consequences to somebody not meeting you the way that you needed, but that is different from trauma. And, and what you're saying, I think is so important because it empowers a person to go on with God yes. and not wait for somebody else to get it. Right. Yeah. No, that's really important because I don't get it. I feel right. people in my best intentions and part of being in relationship is extending grace and hoping that grace is extended to you. Right. And so I think it underscores both the importance of really seeing people before you maybe act or respond, like really try to get inside what they're asking for or what they're needing, but also trusting that just like with me and my story, that God is on their journey with them, right. just like he's on the journey with you. And he has all of those possibilities held in his hand. And it may, I think that's part of what makes Christian community frightening, at least for me, is the fear that I'm going to fail somebody in a way that would damage their faith. And my own experience of that gives me, when I'm really thinking clearly, gives me confidence that God has them just like he held me. And he could use my failure, which honestly, my pride hates this thought, but he could use my failure in their life, just like he used other people's failure in my life. And it's not just that I was failed. Lots of people stepped in and showed up in ways that were really profoundly good. It just, in some ways, the failures are the things that 
maybe catch your attention because you're not necessarily expecting them. And it's in that, like C.S. Lewis says, God shouts in your pain. Those are sometimes the ways he most effectively gets your attention because when you're not experiencing pain, I think, or at least I can be deluded into thinking I'm actually walking with God when I'm maybe walking away from him or at least walking farther from him. And I think, too, I mean, just from a sanctification standpoint, like I know in my own life, I have, God has made me sensitive to things he needed to change in me yes. by letting me experience that kind of poor behavior from somebody. It's like when somebody treats you badly in a particular yeah. way, all of a sudden you realize what it's like to be on the receiving end of that. And it can make you very aware that you, that's not how you want to. Right. It's the whole difference between trying to behave well and really having a heart to, you want to do the right thing instead of feeling pressured to do the right thing. And sometimes that really does come out of ask, have, experiencing somebody else's sin and realizing yeah. that is not the person I was created to be. That's not the person I want to be. And the Lord can use that. You're right. It's yeah. He uses everything. <laughs> he does. So. He does. And I, and it's interesting that this whole exercise of just mentally preparing for this conversation. I don't know that I'd ever reviewed my trajectory, my story of church, but it is very interesting is that the story unfolds how that pattern of real, like, growth and substance and newness would happen at each church I went to. And then there was some sort of pain or failure or disappointment that kind of moved me to the next place. So when I look back at my whole sort of story of church and, and the people in the church, as I moved from church to church, just did the normal sort of development of life and moving different places. And I was thinking about that yesterday. In each situation, I got some really something really profoundly transformative for my spiritual walk, mm -hmm. a new, almost breathtaking way of seeing life and knowing God. And I also got a hefty dose of pain and disappointment and so i moved from from my home church to college and found a church in college that was really different than the church i had grown up in very experimental with their worship i remember clearly worship services where they just did all music from africa or all jewish music or just these really different worship formats that were not the hymns that were in my little red hymn book that I had sung my entire life. And so really expanded my way of worshiping that the pastor was a really good communicator and preached this whole series while I was there on grace that completely blew my mind open to what grace actually is and what the gospel really accomplished. And it was so ironic because I remember sending those worship services just being this sponge that soaked up this different take on theology. And then two years later, we discovered that he had been having a 26 year long affair with his secretary and wow. it kind of what, what I had received from him that felt so true and real then comes into question because obviously he was making choices that didn't align with what he was saying from the pulpit. And so I had to wrestle with that and just trust again that God was speaking through this man to my heart in ways that nobody else had up until that point. And I could trust what was true because I was hearing that from the spirit of God, not from this man who had failed morally in his personal choices. And 
could be grateful for that. It could be sad for the church. We had moved on by then. We graduated and moved to a different city, but I could still be grateful for what God had given me, even though it felt icky, honestly. <laughs> Yeah. Um, well, and I would imagine it would, you'd have to re reevaluate like what part of it was true and what part of it was his distortion to justify exactly. his behavior. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I, I think there was always, there's always something good in that, in, in the reexamination of yes. what was I just, because I was so open because of a lot of things were happening in my life in college and I was just open to hear truth, what else was I open to? And being able to re-examine and refine and and go back to God with these theological principles and wrestle them out. It was an opportunity to do that that probably wouldn't have done if we hadn't heard that news and called that and called into question what we had listened to under his teaching. So I do think, as I look back, and my story gets a little more, I wouldn't say necessarily traumatic and personal trauma, but there was some trauma. As I look back at those early experiences, I'm very grateful for the way God kindly shepherded me into evaluating what I was experiencing at church. And I don't think I thought of this until yesterday almost training me for what was coming and giving me a good foundation of being open to the goodness that he was offering me through these different experiences and being resilient and and careful to steward where I put my trust in the painful times so that when some of these other things happened, I didn't have the same kind of foundational shaking of my faith because I had these experiences where God had kindly carried me through maybe smaller pains, if you will, such that when the larger things happened, I had a, I don't want to, I don't think process is the right word, but I had, I had something to fall back on. I had an experience with God that I could count on even when my current experience was very unsettling and painful. So I think there's a reality to the term deconstruction gets used a lot and that can be a literary term. And so it's not often used that way when we're talking about church. I think unbundling maybe is the word that I like better yeah, yeah. i heard sky jatani on the holy post podcast use that and it sounds because you the lord had already guided you through a practice of unbundling as you went of yeah. sifting yeah through all right mm-hmm. what part of this is god what part right. of it is not right you already had a you did you had a process or a practice in play it almost like a spiritual discipline in place yeah, yeah. to be able to continually unbundle and re-examine what is of God, what is true, what yeah. is not. Right. And I think there's so much wisdom in that. For, for people who start out with a, I saw that in a church environment that I was in, that was very, it was very abusive and very, mm-hmm. and the people who were harmed the most were the ones who came to Christ in the middle of that because they mm-hmm. had no other frame of reference those of us who already had a strong foundation with the lord could pass through that and we it was harmful it was definitely harmful but it did not shake our core belief in god the same way and and i think that's why because we already had a sense of who he was that had not been shaped by that environment No, I think that's really important. And I think that's why, as I was thinking yesterday, that experience in college became so much more important in my mind because it was where I really became personally convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that God was real, that he loved me, that he chose me, that I was his and all of the other things could 
shake that or could I wasn't impervious, but he was. And and he would hold me through whatever. And that just was personally mine. You couldn't, you could do a lot of things to me to hurt me, but you couldn't take that from me unless I chose to give it away. But that was right. my experience, my choice, my conviction. And, and it didn't, it, it wasn't shaped by my circumstances. In fact, I've been working, I work for a larger story and I've been working on a, a course of Larry's material. And so I was, I've been reading so much Larry Crabb, <laughs> so much, but I read a statement that I hadn't actually seen before, or it hadn't stuck with me that was so profound. And he said somewhere, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said something to the effect of God promises to form me, but he doesn't promise to form my circumstances. And it crystallized what I had experienced that huh. in all of these, and the story keeps going, in all of these circumstances, God was faithful to form me, like yeah. whether it was the pain of leaving my little church family or my pastor not answering my questions or not, he was always forming me. And my frustration with the situation was that he wasn't forming my circumstances the way I wanted him to, Sure, but when I could step back away from that pain and disappointment and see the good work he was doing in me. That's what he promised us in Romans 8. He's forming me. And if I can be really glad for that, really grateful and hold on to that, it gives me the strength to weather the circumstances that he's not forming the way I want him to. So while I don't think I could have articulated that certainly not that clearly as it was happening. I do think that's what was happening in me was some recognition that the forming that was happening in me, was more important than what was happening around me, at least for my personal walk with God. Yeah, for sure. And I think ultimately, even with church trauma, you're still not at the mercy. The process looks different. It is right. a lot harder. It, it is, is a lot harder. Somebody sure. who has no other sense of God than what they've had from an evil person misusing his name. Absolutely. But he still knows you and wants you and you, there is still mm -hmm. a path forward. So right. you, there is, nobody is without the power. Nobody can, nobody else can take away your ability to find God. Yes. And I think that's part of what I'm hearing that's really key to understand mm -hmm. is we still, we still can come to God with all the broken pieces, right. with all of the confusion, whether it's setting aside and recognizing that there's just hurt that we forgive and we move on and yeah. we still choose him or whether there's a really hefty process of taking apart and then and finding him in the middle yeah. of the brokenness, yeah. he's still there and he still wants to be known and he still loves us and he doesn't break a bruised reed. Yeah. He says that there's a tenderness in his dealing with us in drawing us on to know him and he can still be known even yeah. when we've experienced great harm. Yeah. That's so good. In Colleen. fact, maybe go a step further and say sometimes he can be more readily known or more deeply known because at least for me, I'm so much more aware of my need mm. in those places of being deeply bruised. And if I can open up my heart to what grace he's offering, it's very profound in those moments of or seasons of deep hurt. I, I don't, I think I want the blessed, easy life as much as anyone, <laughs> maybe more. But when I look back on my journey, the times of greatest difficulty were the times that I was the most connected to the Trinity and the most desperate for their love and 
pursuit. And I think in reality, I'm just as desperate on a good day as a bad day, but my awareness of that desperation is much more accessible to me. And I act on it in a much more passionate way when I'm aware of that desperation. And so as I look back, I think it's harder to do in the middle of those situations, but as I look back, I can be really grateful for those times because those were the times where I really grew up in my faith and in my understanding of who God is and how he loves me. And so I I hear what you're saying. My story is not as fraught with trauma as many stories are. And I'm grateful for that. But I am grateful for the desperate times, at least right now. <laughs> um, check in <laughs> and remind me to be grateful. <laughs> yeah. 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 I what think, happened? What was next? Yeah. As, I, as we moved into sort of adulthood and I got married in college and we, I think that's in, in my kids are now, my oldest is just out of college and I have two boys in college and this is a difficult season for, for your life in church. I think churches don't know what to do with young adults very well and they're moving a lot and their life is very transitory and so we experienced that too. And mostly as I think about that, we were just looking for friends. You leave college where you have this great friend group and then cast out on this sea of adulthood. And it's somewhat traumatic going from that college bubble to real life. And we floundered trying to find a church for, gosh, almost eight years. We just bounced around, but we did find a really good group of Christian friends, a small community. We still actually connect with those guys every year, even though we're all in different cities now. And that was just such a blessing to have friends who are in a similar season and we could just enjoy entering into this season of life together. Church was a means to an end, on it, if I'm honest, of just finding people in that season. And I'm grateful for that, but I wouldn't say that it was a significant part of my spiritual life in those years. But then we had kids and I don't know, something about having little ones, you you had greater needs again. And we had moved to Atlanta by that time and we found a great church here. We were in this church for 12 years. It was a large church and it just became the hub of our life. Our kids went to school there. Rich was an elder. It was my husband. We were very involved in their small group or discipleship programs. We we went on mission trips with this church. Like It was the fundamental, significant part of our life. And we actually started, what started was just a small group that met in our home, kind of became, I think, what today we would call a home church. But we had regularly for about 10 years, 50 to 80 people who came to our house after church on Sunday. And it was that little church I had grown up in way back in the day, but it was basically just an extended family that we did life together for probably about eight years. And obviously that was a very formative, just that whole experience was very formative for us. I personally, like God reached into my life and shifted some of my theology in ways that had a profound impact on how I lived my life. Mostly, I think God was preparing me for what would eventually be my experience with Larry Crabb and another ministry that's led by a man named Larry Bolden. So my Larry's came into my life in that season. And, but a lot of that transition for me was moving away from the wrongly held belief that if I was good enough, God would love me enough. And if I checked all the right boxes and did all the right things, my life would work out. And in your thirties, like that kind of worked for me as a teenager and even into my twenties, but in my thirties, life just got out of control. There were not enough boxes and I couldn't check enough of them. And uh, the relational 
pain had accumulated enough that I couldn't escape it. And as I also developed theologically and gained a real restful understanding of God's sovereignty and how he held me, no matter the circumstances of my life, it was walking me toward this way of living in pursuit of relational holiness because of my relational sin and away from, if I can just get my behavioral sin managed well enough, I'll be okay. So that was significant. That was this, and it was like a decade <laughs> of mm-hmm. kindly moving me toward that. But at the same time, like I said, we were tightly integrated in that church and even family members were part of the church. And we had some family situations that I won't go into detail, but they became very divisive. And eventually we, even though the church was large, it became untenable for both of both families to stay in the church. And it became clear to us that God was moving us somewhere else. And it was very painful. 12 years and like I said, so tightly integrated and I loved my church. I loved the people. I loved what it stood for. I loved the way it impacted the community. It felt very aligned to my own theological beliefs at that point. And it was painful to leave. And at that point, we we did have, like I said, this community group or home church meeting in our house, and they weren't leaving the church. They, pretty much all of them stayed, which I wanted them to stay, but it, it created this difference of, yeah. And so for a couple of years, we actually maintained our home church with members from the church we had been at and the church we went to, which was interesting because we would come from these different services and come to our house and there was a little bit of a culture clash because the two churches were very different. And that was actually significant learning experience for us just to see that in microcosm every Sunday afternoon. But we went to this smaller church, which was actually fun to go for the big church. Even though we were well known, I felt like we had the best of both worlds because we had all of the opportunity of a large church and yet we had this tightly knit smaller group within the church but going to a smaller church especially for our oldest child was really important it was a place where she felt much more at home and her she was entering high school at the time and it was just a good place for her to land and i we've made a lot of decisions about church based on what's been good for our kids And that was a good decision for us. But in that small church, we experienced maybe misunderstanding or a misuse of spiritual authority. And we also responded to that in ways that weren't honoring. We could do some things differently. I probably would do them differently. but, But we were also dealt with in... In a way, I wouldn't say it was abusive because we weren't particularly vulnerable, but it was, again, it was a misuse of authority. And I think had we been vulnerable, it would have been considered abusive. So again, this was a place where we had tightly, one thing about us as a family is is when we're in, we're all in. So we had come in and we had embraced this little church and the people in it and had tightly integrated our life with them. And so when we knew we needed to leave, it was difficult. It was a, it was a, yeah, it was definitely a break. And, And now our kids are involved and they're also, they were also at ages where they weren't very communicative. Teenagers, are definitely old enough to know what's going on and not real comfortable talking deeply about what's going on in them and maybe not even able to really articulate it. And and it created a lot of confusion in our family 
about what was happening and why we were making certain decisions. And, and so it was just painful. And, and we had to weather that storm as a family and as a, and even as an extended family, because it impacted the people who were part of our community group. And so once again, we were now trying to process, you know, what's happening and trying to help our kids process it. And God, I think, used those circumstances, certainly for me, he used them in ways that he had been doing all along. But for our kids, they now had to make some of the same decisions I had to make when I was a teenager. And and they had to decide, is this, am I going to trust God even when I can't trust the people of God? Or am I going to put the sins of the people of God at the feet of God and blame him for them? And we did have to walk through that together. And I would never choose it. <laughs> it was good. It was a good working out of our faith. And I'm grateful for the things that God did, both in me and in my kids. And that story is still going on. I had Ivy on this podcast, my, my daughter, a couple of weeks ago, and she was mentioning a little bit of her experience. And, and I just thought, it's time to have another conversation. She's further along and she's processed more. And I'd love to know what God has done in the meantime in her. So that's good. Yeah. That's good. Thank you. Carlene, for sharing all of that and for our audience, I hope that, I hope that you won't just listen to this. I hope that you'll be thinking about your own experience and some of the categories that, that Carlene talked about, and that'll become a source of conversation with God, maybe to look back and revisit even the narratives that you've told yourself and start a conversation with God about like, how did he show up? Where, did he show up in ways that perhaps you missed at the time? And I certainly have at various points in my life, I can look at back and see more clearly in retrospect than sometimes I did in the moment yeah. how God was at work. Yeah. But One more thing I wanted to share, because again, as I was just reflecting yesterday, I don't know that this had actually loaded up to the conscious level of my brain is significant, but I would say my current situation is less than what I wish it was. The church we go to is a solid, it's a great church. It's been really good for our kids. And for me, it's just, eh, it's just not the place I would choose to land, but it's clearly where God has landed me. And yet when I go so it's a larger church. The worship service is maybe just typical of what you would experience in a larger church these days. Very top-notch, excellent musicians, people we know, they really love the Lord, but maybe just not the way I would choose to worship. And let, yet every time I walk in, almost every time, and I'm just in the worship service and maybe even a little grumpy or not, like when they've chosen that song or don't even like it, <laughs> I then just experience God and the tears just run down my face. And I am just feel embraced by the Holy Spirit. And it, it, I'm not a hands in the air. I'm a stand there and sway. It's not that kind of emotional experience. It's just this deep knowing that God is with me. And so once again, even when things aren't ideal in my mind, I can't escape the fact that God wants me there and meets me there. And so I know that it's trendy if you will, to question church, to maybe even give up on church. And I think there's lots of things that need to be reformed or done differently. 
And yet it's still the place where God's people are and where God is. He says, when we gather, he's there. And gosh, I just experienced that in a way as I've gotten older, that is inescapable. So keep going to church. Maybe not the one you're at, or maybe it, I think. Find some spiritual, some yeah. fellowship. Yeah. That's giving you, has somebody in your life that is helping yeah. you form into the image of Christ. That's right. Yeah. And yeah. don't give up on, God has used the church for 2000 years and he still intends to do that. I think. Thank you, Carlene. We are going to have Carlene next month as well. We're going to do a little deeper dive into what that home church experience was like. But for our listeners, thank you so much for joining us. And we are having a book club right now on Real Church, the book, Larry's book, Real Church. And if you want an opportunity to discuss and explore with other believers, Maybe you haven't been in church for a while and you're trying to figure out how to come back, how to sort mm -hmm. through all of what your experience has been and, yeah. and figure out what God's leading you to next or how to find him again in the middle of what your experience was. That might be a good way to dip your toe in, mm -hmm. to have conversations mm -hmm. with some other believers and to be able to revisit what has happened to you but also to look back and see where God was with you and where he is still with you. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank we'll you. See you next time. Bye. If you like what you heard today, hit the like button just below, then come back by subscribing to our podcast channel for more resources on relational spirituality, go to our website at larger